Hello and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Tyler Paley. Thanks for joining us. Tis the season for giving, and tonight, Cronkite News is honoring some of the people, organizations, and nonprofits that help make Arizona great. Here's a look back at some of our favorite stories that celebrate the spirit of the season. Arizona ranks fifth worst in the nation for youth homelessness, but one program in Arizona is working to improve that number. Reporter Drew Marine takes us to Tucson, where the home office serves as a safe space for children who may not always have a place to call home. Only a few months into her freshman year, and Old Main has already become a favorite place on campus for Kennedy Griffin. Like thousands of others her same age. Are they going to be Kennedy's path has led here, to the University of Arizona. Something that we're morally required to do. But for Kennedy, the journey to campus was different than most. A learning experience of another kind. So then I moved in with my grandma when I was, after my mom died. Um, and then my dad was around for a minute. And then when I was like seven, I think it was just like a lot for him. So then like he kind of like dipped. Without a traditional family life. It's always been me, grandma, dog. The 18 year old began searching for help to break the cycle of poverty and homelessness. If your family makes like this much income, we can help you with like scholarships and blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking and I'm like, oh, I don't fit here because I look for, like in a, you know, two parent, um, one parent home. And, but like my grandma was like a nurse at times, so she was exceeding the amount. So I'm like, um, I can't afford to go to college then. The nonprofit Youth on Their Own not only helps students financially, but they also give actively enrolled students access to 10 pounds of food a week. Thanks to an on-site mini mall, complete with canned food, cereal, clothes, and personal items like toothbrushes and tampons. They really feel like they finally have a person who's in their corner who actually cares whether or not they go to school or cares whether or not they do well. Um, and that is really kind of a honor. Yodo did more than support a teen, like they supported a family. That's how 19-year-old Serena La Madrid was able to take care of three siblings. A five-year-old, a little baby. I hardly saw her because I was always working. If not working, I was in school. And like, I pretty much only saw her like to go to sleep or if not, like in the morning to take her to school. Hearing how can we help you is the best thing to hear in the whole entire world. The nonprofit has given almost $700,000 in stipends in exchange for good grades and attendance. If you maintain, I think it's above a C, um, then you get about, for the full thing, I think it's about 124, 125 that they'll give you a month. Of this uh, move. Which allows students like Kennedy to focus less on making ends meet and more on her musical studies. Between alternative uh, courses of action. In Tucson, Drew Marine, Cronkite News. Visitors have been leaving mementos at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington almost since the day it was de dedicated in 1982. Those items now number more than 250,000. But unlike any other memorial in Washington, these items are carefully preserved. Washington reporter Bailey Vogt explains. On a cold November morning at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Howie Howe comes to see his two foster brothers' names on the memorial wall and to leave photos in memory of one. One of him and one of us at the last reunion when there were four of us still above the ground. Now we're down to three. Visitors like Howe leave items at the wall every day to honor a loved one whose name is here among the fallen from that war. I think a, a lot of people are, you know, really come here and they, they leave what's heartfelt and I, I think that would be a comfort to them to know that it wasn't just dumped in a dumpster someplace. Well, those items might not stay there forever. They're not going to be destroyed either. Instead, they're going to be taken to a facility in Maryland where they'll be cataloged for historical purposes. The items are brought to this National Park Service warehouse in Landover, Maryland. Museum curator Jan Fulkertz oversees the cataloging and preservation of the estimated 200 to 250,000 items. This is a secure and environmentally controlled facility um, and we uh, keep the items that are left at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in storage here. Those items come from all over the map in more ways than one. From Arizona alone, Fulkert shows items ranging from an APH-5 flight helmet to postcards, from hats to stuffed animals. Fulkert says that the main focus of the collection is to keep a record of the stories that the Vietnam War created, no matter how incomplete they are.
What we get is what we get, um, but we get so many different stories and so many different things um, that it really tells um, so much of what um, happened in Vietnam and what's happening since and why the memorial is important to different people. How agrees, saying that he appreciates what leaving an item at the wall allows for those who lost loved ones during the war. People leave things that they don't, they don't necessarily uh, be understood by others, but they're significant to them for, for, for whatever reason. On the National Mall, Bailey Vote, Cronkite News. As many Arizonans plan for the holidays with their families, not everyone will get to spend time with those they love. Cronkite News reporter Bridget Dowd traveled to Fort Huachuca, the U.S. Army Intelligence Center, to find out how soldiers will be spending their Thanksgiving. For many of the soldiers here at Fort Huachuca, this is their first Thanksgiving that they're spending away from their families, and the Adopt-A-Soldier program gives them a chance to have some home-cooked hospitality. Soldiers here are trained in military intelligence and maintain rigorous daily schedules. As many Americans will travel to reunite with relatives this month, troops don't always have that luxury. Because we have such a high training population here, a majority of our soldiers won't be able to go home for Thanksgiving. They're saving up their leave and their money and their time to go home at Christmas shortly afterwards, but Thanksgiving is a little bit tough. Instead, soldiers at the Army base will be matched with community members through the Adopt-A-Soldier program and will eat Thanksgiving dinner in the comfort of a home. Cochise County here in southern Arizona has one of the highest veterans populations in the nation. And so our community wants to maintain that connection with our service members. Linton says they often have more families who want to take someone in than they have soldiers. The program also gives them a break from the dining hall food they eat every day. It also matches soldiers to families with similar dietary preferences. We have soldiers who are vegetarian or vegan. We've had families that have come forth and said, hey, we celebrate a vegetarian Thanksgiving. We invite those soldiers into our homes. With full stomachs and a little love from their adopted families, the soldiers will return to the base to continue their training. In Sierra Vista, Bridget Dowd, Cronkite News. Now the deadline for families to apply to adopt a soldier is November 17th. It's sometimes a struggle to connect today's youth with older veterans. But one Arizonan has found a way through crocheting for a cause. Sydney Eisenberg reports. According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, as of January 2016, there were more than 1,000 veterans who were homeless or living in temporary housing in Arizona. In Anthem, two groups are using plastic bags to help those homeless veterans feel a little more comfortable. These plastic bags are seeing new life thanks to the Daisy Mountain Veterans and Youth for Troops. We make plastic sleeping mats for the homeless veterans out of recycled plastic bags from Walmart, the grocery stores. It keeps you warm in the winter months and it keeps you off the cold and the wet in the summer. Volunteers gathered at the Anthem Civic Building to sort, cut, and loop plastic into long chains that would be crocheted into mats. It's not very hard once you get used to it. Austin Friedman was able to pick up crocheting after just a few minutes. He was even able to give me a lesson. And then you pull the two loops over and you just made another piece of the long chain there is. Not only do these plastic mats help homeless veterans, they also connect veterans to a younger generation. Derry Berry herself is a Marine veteran from the Vietnam era. She says her favorite part is teaching kids how to help her friends who also served. One of the young girls I was showing how to crochet, she said, is there a right way or a wrong way? I said, no, this is all made with love. There's no right way or wrong way. I feel proud because like, they deserve to get back on their feet again for helping us, so we should help them. Now these groups plan to distribute 50 mats to different shelters and organizations. In the broadcast center, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. While some are celebrating the start of the holiday season, it can be a tough time for children in foster care who may not be able to be with their family. I traveled to Scottsdale last night where the Love Up Foundation brought hundreds of Arizona foster kids a little Christmas magic. Lights, music, and gifts wrapped in red and green. 
Those are just a few pieces of a typical family's Christmas. But for someone who's been in and out of the foster care system, this celebration is far from typical. But the rest of us that are stuck in foster care systems and in group homes, Sometimes we don't get that luxury of having presents underneath the Christmas tree with our name under it. Amanda Jenkins has been in and out of group homes since she was three years old. She's now 19 with a two-year-old and a baby on the way. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine my life without her. The Love Up Foundation partnered with Cox Charities and the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess to give foster children a sneak peek at the 8th annual Christmas at the Princess celebration. Department of Child Safety Director Greg McKay says Arizona has made significant improvements in its foster care programs, but the state still has a big problem when it comes to child abuse and neglect. This event is recognizing kids in group homes, kids with kinship families, kids in foster care homes. It's recognizing those people that provide care with a special event, but it's also showing everybody we still got a big problem here and we need more people to, to step forward and help us. We never have a place to call our own. That bed is just a temporary bed that we sleep in. Like, some of us don't even come with anything at all. We just come with one backpack on our back, because it's all we have. So for them to do stuff like this, to give us presents, to do stuff for the kids, like, that's just made an impact on my life, and that's what makes me want to be, when I turn 21, to go work in a group home. Weekends are hard for kids in need. They don't get school lunches and can go all weekend with little to no food. But as Erica Arrington reports, an Arizona nonprofit was started by an Arizona woman who heard about the extreme need. He had just been in a school cafeteria and he basically watched one of his students go through the trash and pull food out that she thought was acceptable um, to use and so she would wrap it in napkins and put it in her pockets and he later found that she was from a low income family. She had a brother and sister so they ate breakfast and lunch at school through the federally funded program but they didn't eat on weekends. Lisa Scarpinato, co-founder of Kitchen on the Street, started the program to help eliminate situations like that by providing food for students to take home. So bags of hope are food backpacks that kids pick up on Friday at school, carry home, and consume the contents over the weekend. So that in conjunction with the federally funded breakfast and lunch program allows these kids access to food seven days a week. Here in Arizona, 28% of children are food insecure according to No Kid Hungry. Maryland School is one of the 33 schools participating in the program. For me, just for people to be aware that this is an issue like poverty and you know, hunger, it's a, it's a real issue and how it affects, you know, the students here at school and not just at home. These bags have meals in them that are canned, so they're non-perishable, that include red beans and rice and beef stew and other meals like that and also some snacks that include pretzels, some applesauce and also granola bars so that the kids have something to eat on the weekends. Last year, Kitchen on the Street distributed more than 51,000 bags of hope to nearly 2,000 students. It's priceless. I don't know how to put it into words. In Phoenix, Erica Arrington, Cronkite News. While well, holiday travelers are flooding the airports, shoppers are getting ready to flood the malls, and volunteers are flooding soup kitchens and food pantries. As Fraser Allen Best reports, it's a welcome change from the feast or famine cycle that food banks face during the rest of the year. At food banks, like so others might eat in Washington, the Thanksgiving rush is on with donations flooding in, a rush that pantry manager Anna Urand wishes she could stretch throughout the year. I always say, hey, why don't you do Christmas in July? and that'll prepare us for the slower months of August and September. That seasonal boom and bust is seen by food banks across the country, like the one run by Vineyard Church in North Phoenix, where Jim Hummel is director of operations. It's, it's that time of year when the people just are more apt to give. And the summertime is lower in donations. Hummel says that when donations get quiet at other times of year, the pantry does outreach to keep contributions up. He says that while it's not the same as the end of year rush, it keeps a steady supply of food coming in. We do three food drives a year as well, canned food drives. We, we get a lot of food donated. Food banks, like so others might eat, also try to be proactive to beat the summer doldrums. Everybody is um, on their summer vacations, they're at the beach, and we're still here, and we're still trying to feed the hungry. Hummel says that the end of year rush might be more than just a show of holiday spirit. We qualify for the Arizona tax credit for the, for the working poor, so we start getting in 
some of those donations. Overall, the message from food banks is to remember the spirit of charity, even when Thanksgiving is long past. In Washington, Fraser Allen Best, Cronkite News. More than 50% of Arizona's homeless live here in Maricopa County. As Cronkite News reporter Steven Sidner explains, the city of Phoenix is launching a new plan to respond to the problem. So my lungs gave out, I was, ran out of money, which led, of course, one thing to another to another. Just kind of a snowball effect. Last summer, Lori Wenzel and her sister lived in a patch tent near I-17 in Grand. It was kind of hell. You know, you live outdoors during the summer, it happens. And it happens to more than 3,200 people in Arizona, according to the latest count of unsheltered people completed in January. Moises Gallegos, the director of human services for the city of Phoenix, says that the new plan known as Phoenix Cares will connect those in need with organizations that can help. Number one, uh, uh a strategy is to bring people to services. That's our goal. So we do not provide housing directly ourselves, but there are many programs in the community. We are connected with all of those programs. What the program does do is create a single place for residents to place their concerns so the city can then respond. As the calls come in, uh, human services staff will look at that information and where the encampment is being reported. Uh, they, they will direct the resources of a homeless engagement team that would go out and engage individuals to help bring them into services. Gallego says that the reason for this new program is because the unsheltered population is growing. According to the Maricopa Association of Governments, street homelessness is up 60% in the county since 2015. Wenzel is glad to be off the streets and offers this advice to others who are struggling. Put your faith in God and put one front of, foot in front of the other and live life. In Phoenix, Stephen Sidner, Cronkite News. The city will have community meetings next month where they will unveil the plan and the number to call and when to call. We recycle trash, so why not bikes? A new shop in Mesa teaches cyclists of all ages how to repair, maintain, and recycle bicycles. Reporter Emily Richardson gives us a spin around the new location. He's been helping me with my bike, and he's been telling me what to do, and I've been doing it. It helped me learn how to fix bikes. And that's one of the goals of WeCycle. WeCycle is a community bike shop, nonprofit, recycling bicycles for kids and adults in need. Founder Robert Chacon started this organization while working in vocational rehabilitation. He saw that the people he helped get jobs had transportation issues. He began fixing bikes out of his garage to give to them. When his garage couldn't fit any cars because of how many bikes he had, he decided to open this shop. It's, it's more than just a bike shop. We, we don't sell bikes. We don't have bikes, uh, you know, with parts and all this stuff like a bike shop. We're just open to the public so they can come in and work on their bikes. So it's, it's a good thing to teach people how to fix their own bicycles. And Chacon wants them to learn how at a young age. We try to teach the kids responsibility. We try to teach them um, recycling. Uh, we try to teach them that bicycles are an, a viable form of transportation. Leonel Puga came in with his brother. They had their eyes on two bikes that needed some work. I saw a bike and I really liked it. All the Puga boys needed to do was put in the work to get them road ready. My favorite part is really just teaching the kids. And for adults in need of wheels, all it takes is eight hours of volunteering. Chacon is motivated to help anyone who has a desire to ride, no matter what age. I had a 90-year-old grandmother come in with, to get her, her great-grandkids bikes, but she had never ridden a bike before. She had never owned a bike or ridden a bike. And I fixed her a bike, and I taught her how to ride a bike. In Mesa, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. If you would like to donate to WeCycle or would like to learn how to work on your bike, the shop is located on Main Street in Mesa. Some consider the art a luxury, but to the city of Phoenix, they're much more than that. And Kira Camarigny looked into the industry that contributes millions of dollars and thousands of jobs to the economy. Lots of very beautiful paintings, uh, statues. A day at the museum. I think probably the most interesting to me were the old artifacts. William Harshman is one of many people who spend his time and money at local art exhibits. Today, his spending is directly to the museum. So far, just the admission. But Scottsdale Museum of the West director and CEO Mike Fox says that oftentimes, visitors spend money on more than just tickets, called indirect spending. They buy dinners before or after the event. They pay for... Uh, baby care. A recent report reveals that the arts generated over $400 million in 2015, up from $300 million in 2012. 
The study, conducted by Americans for the Arts, looks at the economic impact of nonprofit culture organizations and their audiences in cities across the country. The findings of the report were presented at the Building a Prosperous Phoenix Through the Arts event, where Mayor Greg Stanton spoke about how the arts even affects his job. The arts make a city in so many ways. I can't recruit great businesses to Phoenix if we're not in a fun, interesting place to live. The report also stated that the industry supports over 12,000 jobs in the city. This includes any job that contributes to the experience, such as performers, exhibit workers, and even valet parkers. It's a phenomenal uh, ripple effect throughout our communities because what do they do with their money? They go and they spend it. In Scottsdale, in Caracol, Marinia, Cronkite News. The study also shows that these results are not strictly local. The arts industry generated over $160 billion nationally in 2015. Not every child has access to a music education, but new federal guidelines show it's a key to a well-rounded education. Reporter Mia Atkins found a local music academy that wants to make sure students get the chance to play an instrument, even if they can't afford it. Victoria Aurora is a student at Rosie's House, a music academy that gives free music lessons and instruments to children who are economically disadvantaged. I'm very lucky to um, have private lessons because Rosie's House gives um, these opportunities to low-income families. Not only does Rosie's House improve its students' musical abilities, it also improves academic success, leadership skills, and social skills. According to Carolee Hagen, president of the Arizona Music Educators Association, for the first time, music is listed as an essential part of a well-rounded education under the federal Every Student Succeeds Act. Now, specifically, we can say, you know, music is important and is justified in its own right. Music teacher Katie Valadez says elementary to high school students who learn to play are investing in their future. Being a student at Rosie's House requires a certain level of commitment and dedication. It takes that kind of commitment and hard work to apply to college. Hagen says that playing in a music ensemble can prepare students for more than an audition. They become more and more confident in how to handle themselves. I tell them it's as if you are walking into an interview. Aurora practices the flute for hours and has become used to playing in front of a crowd. Through dedication, um, you can achieve anything. So I have dedicated myself to practicing. 97% of Rosie's House students that graduate high school go on to enroll in college. In Phoenix, Mia Atkins, Cronkite News. You may see some more saguaros around Maryvale, 50 more to be exact. It's part of the Maryvale community's traveling cacti project. Marcia Opong shows us how these cacti are created. I'm standing here with Shelby Johnson's third grade class at Victory Collegiate Academy in North Phoenix. They painted this tall six foot cactus courtesy of Maryvale Revitalization as part of the Traveling Cactus Project. I'm just an artist that like to draw stuff and paint stuff and color. Third grader James Castillo is one of the artists helping with the Traveling Cacti Project. He's helped paint two Sororos. I color with green and white some blue. The Traveling Cacti Project is sponsored by the Maryvale Revitalization Corporation. All of the cacti will be on display at Desert Sky Mall for the launch of the project. Then they'll travel to businesses in the area. Each one is unique, created by boys and girls clubs, community centers, and charter schools. Our kids loved it, and, and like I said, it's, just a, it's an easy way for us to incorporate a little bit of art and to give back to the community into this project. This is the first big project. Um, where we used like a wood, you know, wood and then paint and glitter. And so this was definitely the big first project and the first thing that's been um, requested by someone outside of the school. Victory Collegiate Academy received three cactuses to paint for the project and are currently working on their third one. Anything hands-on, um, anything just out of the norm where they can be creative and express themselves, they really, really enjoy that. We're always looking for opportunities uh, to do different project-based learning, to things like this, and this was a great one for us. The school plans to participate in more art projects in the future. In Phoenix, Marcia Oponk, Cronkite News. 
The cacti will be on display at Desert Sky Mall from January through May before traveling to other businesses. If you spot one, take a photo and post it using hashtag traveling cacti. Thanksgiving is all about giving back to the community. And as Kevin Gessner reports, dancing is making a difference for patients at Phoenix Children's Hospital. At first glance, this may look like a regular event at any college. Young adults dancing in a room with loud music, flashing lights, and free food. But when you take a closer look, these students are dancing for a cause that event director Amanda Arnold says changes lives. Dance Marathon is a six hour event that raises money for the kids at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Um, we stand for the kids that are in hospital beds that can't stand up right now, that can't be here to dance, so we dance for them. Patients from Phoenix Children's have attended the event for years, like 17 year old Isaiah. He's received care from PCH ever since he was born and looks forward to Dance Marathon each year. While he can't speak, he relies on his phone to communicate. It gets to help out the hospital a whole lot. Plus, we get to have a lot of fun in the long run. The event raises money for items in the hospital that are considered non-medically essential. But longtime patients like Ansley McCormick says they are essential to feeling more comfortable at the hospital. People will, were willing to like make it as fun of an experience as possible, whether that's doing crafts or taking me into little secret places that not everybody know about. The money raised could be used for anything from books and learning centers to materials for craft projects. In Tempe. Right. So this year's total is. Kevin Gessner. Oh Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. For more multimedia coverage, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.